My name is Ali. I've been fascinated with the ocean for as long as I can remember. But this romantic vision that I always had of the ocean completely changed. Dr. Stewart is a senior lecturer at the Department of Environment and Geography at the University of York. He is a marine ecologist and fisheries biologist. His research has focused on a vast range of topics, but with a central theme of better understanding the factors regulating marine populations. So I'm sure as many of you guys um, recently also watched the Netflix documentary Sea Spur Sea, and I found that really shocking, as I'm sure many other people did, as it seemed to bring up a lot of important issues that I hadn't yet been aware of, such as the disturbing amounts of bycatch and the shark finning industry, just to name a few. And so we're very grateful that Dr. Stewart is here with us today and can help answer some of the questions on my mind and I'm sure on lots of other people's minds also. So to start with, what inspired you to study and conduct research in marine biology? Yeah, so I actually, um, I'm Australian. I don't know if people can tell. I've been in the UK a long time, but I, I, I try to keep my accent a little bit. So I was brought up in Australia. And then actually when I was eight, um, I moved to Papua New Guinea, which has amazing, um, well, many amazing landscapes, but particularly under the sea, beautiful coral reefs. Um, and so I just loved everything to do with the sea since I was a little kid. Um, apparently when I was about five or six, I, I said to my dad, I wanted to be a professional holiday man. And he's like, that's not really a job, but um, you know, what is it that you like about holidays? And I said, I just love the beach and I love the sea. And, um, and he said, well, you should become a marine biologist. And that was it. So I literally decided my career at about five or six years old. That's very early on, but it seems to have stuck. And so could you describe to our viewers like some of the main research that you are carrying out at the moment? Sure. So, yeah, my research does cover quite a broad range of topics, almost all to do with the sea. Um, so I guess what I'm primarily focused on is sort of making human uses of the sea in all sorts of different ways more sustainable. So I've done a lot of focus on fisheries and fisheries management. One of the things I've been working a lot over the last few years is um, the implications of Brexit for how fisheries are managed around the UK um, and, and, you know, some of the changes that might happen with that. Um, I've also been working on marine protected areas for, gosh, over 20 years now. So these are areas of the sea as the name suggests, are protected at different levels um, from mostly fishing, but other activities as well. And in particular, I've been working up on the Isle of Arran in Scotland for over 10 years now. So that's one of my sort of favourite destinations. <laughs> yeah. And so I think after uh, watching Seas for Sea, a lot of people were inspired to kind of research more about the topic. Yeah. And that's kind of how I came across your tweets um, about the documentary. So could you describe your like main impressions, I guess, of Seas for Sea? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like, like many people, a lot of the scenes were quite shocking. And I commend the film for sort of bringing the issues of overfishing to, you know, basically a global audience like Netflix is all over the place now. And this, you know, this is a huge story. Um, and I guess, you know, in the circles I move on in, you know, being a marine scientist, everyone knows about overfishing, but, but the general public, not so much. And that's been highlighted. So I think, you know, the documentary is obviously great to have done that. And the fact we're having this conversation now, um, but I did have problems with the way it was kind of quite one sided. There were a lot of um, scientific inaccuracies. And at the end of the day, fish is a really important source of food. So over three billion people, that's nearly half the world's population they get 20% of their protein, at least from, um, from different types of seafood and other fish. And so, you know, 
although the, the film sort of comes out with this simple message at the end, like don't eat fish, that's just not an option for huge numbers of people. Mm -hmm. And so I guess starting with kind of the first issue uh, that was kind of like that you mentioned, which was kind of overfishing. So yeah. the documentary talked a lot about sustainable fishing and how that didn't really seem to be like a clear definition for that. So I guess, could you kind of, from like an expert, like what really is sustainable fishing? And yeah. yeah. No, 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 it's a good question. So I think the, the film actually said that sustainable fisheries don't exist. Um, and I would definitely take issue with that. So according to the, um, the United Nations Food and um, Agriculture Organization, about two thirds of the world's fisheries are fished sustainably. So basically that means that, you know, you're keeping them at a certain level and the rate that you're fishing them will not cause the overall population size to decrease any further. Right. So it's a bit like, think of having a bank account and you're, you know, you're taking the interest off and that's what you're living on. Mm -hmm. It's the same with fishing, basically. You want to keep the capital in the bank, um, which is the fish, and, yeah. and harvest the interest. But if you start to eat into the capital, then, you know, eventually <laughs> you're going to have no money left. And it's exactly the same with fish. Mm -hmm. And so I think like what, from my understanding, the documentary seemed to say that, you know, there was such a large extent of overfishing that the fishing population kind of needed to have some time to, I guess, like rebound and from that overfishing. So if the fish have been like, overfished is it like still sustainable to keep it at that level or no so where overfishing has happened and it is still happening and you mm -hmm. know this this is where the fish was the, the film was right about a third of fish stocks in the world are considered overfished that's not right. good and that's been getting worse over the last <laughs> few decades so we're absolutely right we need to do something about it but there are also cases where um Overfishing has been recognized and management structures have been put in place to actually recover populations. Yeah. So I think, you know, go, going back like even over a hundred years ago, the sea was thought to be inexhaustible. You know, we could, we could never fish it down. And then even in the 1950s, um, after the Second World War, there was this view that the ocean was this great resource that we should tap into and you know, okay. feed with and make lots of money from. And it was really only in about maybe the 1980s or 90s that we started to go, whoa, you know, like we're doing this too much. Yeah. And so it's been in the last few decades that management has really improved, but we do still have this problem because the human population is still growing. There's more demand for fish. And so the overfishing is, is still a big issue. Yeah. And so, like, I guess, like you were saying at the end of the film, there was this kind of message of, you know, reduce your fish, fish consumption or eliminate. Um, and I guess, like, like you were saying, for a lot of people, that isn't possible. But for people like myself, I guess, who have, like, lots of other options, mm. what do you think about, like, reducing to, like, a large extent fish consumption? Yeah, I mean, you could you could get into a debate about the sort of health implications and things like that. Whatever yeah. diet you have, you know, you have to think about that. Fish yeah. is actually really nutritious. You know, it's a, it's a good thing to eat. The, um, the NHS and the World Health Organization both advise people to eat two servings of fish a week. Right. Um, actually, if everyone in the world did that, there would be a problem, which is a bit of an issue. So, you know, I think you, if you feel strongly, then yeah, you can, you can reduce your fish consumption if you have that option, but you don't necessarily need to. Um, you know, there's, there are good choices out and, you know, just out there, despite what the film said about things like the Marine Stewardship Council, I actually think they are really good. They're not perfect, but they, they're, it's actually a really good guide. And, you know, you can pretty much guarantee if you see their logo on a product, then it, it is fine to eat that. Okay. So with labels like the Marine Stewardship Council and the Dolphin Safe kind of label also, you would like suggest that those are okay to eat at? 
Yeah, the dolphin um, self, uh, sorry, the dolphin sable friendly label yeah. actually goes right back to the 1990s. And, you know, the film gave them a really hard time as well. Yeah. But it's important to remember that they were actually really the first ones in the world to show to the public some of the things that fishing was doing. Mm-hmm. So right back in the ni- early 1990s, it was revealed by them that some fishermen were setting their nets around um, pods of uh, dolphins to catch tuna. And so they campaigned really hard, you know, to stop that. And that's where that label came from. So they've done heaps of good over the years. Yeah. You actually, if you buy a tin of tuna, you in the UK anyway, you'll find it very difficult to find one that doesn't have that logo on it. So maybe that logo was not as important as it was. But definitely the Marine Stewardship Council, you know, they certify 10% of the world's fisheries. They have resulted in many, many fisheries improving what they do, you know, not just setting their catch limits at the right levels, but also reducing bycatch and effects on the habitat and things like that. So, you know, one or two things get through that are not great. I think you could almost say that about anything. But overall, I personally think they've done, you know, fantastic things for for fisheries management. So, you know, I was I was a bit disappointed, to be fair, seeing them get attacked in the way that they did. Right. And so I guess then on the topic of kind of NGOs and other like organizations that are similar, it also the documentary seemed to say that they weren't talking about like the major plastic pollution in the oceans, which the documentary suggested was from fishing gear and that they were focusing more on like smaller issues such as like, I think the documentary mentioned plastic straws. So I guess, do you think that NGOs do have like a trend of kind of ignoring kind of fishing gear? I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. So there's a few things. First of all, they sort of uh, in the film highlighted the, you know, the Pacific garbage patch and they said, well, yeah. it's actually 40 something percent of, of the debris there was fishing nets. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe that's true, although it's very difficult to measure these things, but that is in one very specific area and it's just what's floating on the surface and fishing gear tends to float. Uh, uh, global studies have found that fishing gear um, counts for about 10% of the plastics in the ocean overall. That's still bad. Like that's, yeah. you know, <laughs> we need to try and stop that. Um, but this is not something that uh, NGOs are ignoring at all. There's lots of them campaigning against that. There's lots of initiatives. There's um, a good one called the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which is NGOs and governments and fishing industry all working together to reduce this fishing um, waste. And so, yeah, it was, you know, it was really unfortunate. I understand though why um, they were right about uh, straws, you know, not really being a big issue, right? Yeah. But what that's done is that's something that everyone can do. You know, you go to the shop, they offer you a straw and you just go, no thanks. And that just puts that in people's minds and then they start to think about other things, you know, what they're doing with other plastics and, you know, recycling and what they do with their litter and all the rest. So although, yes, straws are a very minor issue, it's kind of the gateway to doing more about looking after the environment. So I understand why they've done that. And so just like for people like me who don't really know a lot, um, so if 10% is fishing gear, what would then be the like rest of the plastic in, I guess, the oceans? Sure. So, um, so they think that this is from a Greenpeace study. So they think about another 10% is also from what they call marine activities. So this is okay. other ships, basically. And then the other 80% comes from the land. So that okay. is basically people's waste. Um, going into rivers mostly, and then ending up in the sea. Um, now, you might think, well, well, how does that happen? Like I put all my stuff in the rubbish bin. 
But actually, like, if you walk around, you know, I live in York, you walk around the rivers here, this, they're full of rubbish. Yeah. So things, some people are not so careful. Um, they do throw the rubbish on the land, it blows into the rivers, even sometimes from landfill sites. Um, you know, the rubbish blows off there and it ends up in the wrong place. And then in other parts of the world, they literally just don't have proper waste disposal areas. And so you end up with, you know, the rubbish being put in a river, like you throw it in the river and it floats away, it's gone, but it's not, yeah. it ends up in the sea. So, you know, that the, yes, we need to provide better ways of, of disposing of our waste, but we also need to just try and waste less in the first place, you know, try less single use plastics, you know, just um, be more careful yeah. basically. <laughs> Yeah, I think I can definitely like see that on the Thames because I live in London. <laughs> There's always well, there a go. lot of yeah plastic. Exactly, it, you know, it's quite there. shocking sometimes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and so, I guess for people who, on like an individual level, you would recommend like reducing like use of plastics. So. Yeah, there's lots of things you can do to help the ocean because like fishing is just one of the things that's putting pressure on it. You've also got climate change, you've also got pollution, um, you know, ocean acidification, which comes from carbon dioxide. So to help the ocean, like there's lots of things you can do, um, yeah. you know, just in general, like I said, waste less, but also think about, you know, your climate change footprint in terms of rethinking your transport, cycling, walking, taking the bus, whatever. Um, and then uh, another great thing, like is if you have the opportunity to get involved in things like beach cleans. Yeah. And also, you know, I always say like, just get out there, like go, go to the beach, you know, if, when it warms up a bit, go swimming. Because when you learn to sort of love an area, respect it, then you care for it, you know, and so you're going to be thinking all the time, gosh, I went to that beach the other day and it was beautiful, but so I don't want that to be spoiled. Or maybe it was, maybe there was lots of litter and that sort of fires you up to do something about it. Um, so there's lots of things we can do as individuals. Yeah. And so kind of like on the subject of climate change, the documentary seemed to like suggest that the fishing industry was having a large contribution to climate change. Um, so I guess like, well, I don't know, from the documentary's point of view, it seems like there's not a lot of re regulations on, the, or that they're not being imposed on the fishing industry. Mm. So what do you think about that? I, I think it got a little bit confused there, if I'm honest. So uh, the point they were making was that the actual seabeds mm -hmm. ab like absorb a lot of carbon, but and this can be just everything from, you know, some, some areas are really good at that, like seagrasses and mangroves right. and things like that. And you want to protect those. But even mud like stores carbon, right? And so if you fish it, if you, if you drag a net along the bottom, then you sort of disturb that. And yeah. there's some bit recent work on this. But we don't really understand this very well at all. But we don't think that that carbon, we're almost sure of this, does not get back up into the atmosphere, right? It just, it, because it's in the water and, and carbon dioxide and carbon in the water binds with other molecules. So it, there's almost no evidence to show that it goes back into the atmosphere. And so, you know, it, I can't see how that really would affect Right. basically climate change and they made that link and this was one of those you know these links where it's sort of you hear the word carbon you hear the fishing industries sort of disturbing it and you think oh yeah okay that makes sense but actually there's no evidence for that but there is for those things like mangroves and seagrass and salt marsh and uh, and sadly those areas in a lot of places are not in good shape and so, you know, we need to restore them where we can and protect the ones that exist, absolutely. So I guess for those kind of areas, but also, I guess, um, in terms of just having marine protected areas. So how can like, I think the film said that like in reality, 
NFT um, there's like less than 1% that are properly like regulated and protected, but that there should be around 30%. So how can we actually go about that, I guess? Yeah, that, that is a good question. And they're, they're pretty right about that. So in terms of what we call highly protected marine areas, so these are ones that generally ban fishing and other extractive activities. There's very, very few of those. In the UK, it's like 0.001%. So if you look on the government websites, it will tell you we protect 30 something percent of our seas, but most of those protected areas don't actually offer much protection. Right. So they, sadly, this is something governments do a lot. They sort of make it look like they're doing lots of good things, but they're not necessarily. The target of 30% is something that, you know, Lots of governments seem to be getting behind. Um, I would say the more important thing is just to have more of these well-protected areas and build those up and assess how they're working and like that they're in the right place. And, uh, you know, not necessarily to like suddenly protect a third of the oceans because that actually could have a lot of negative effects on people. And sometimes all you do, if you, if you don't do it carefully, you shift the problem somewhere else, or you actually even can put people's lives at risk by saying, right, you can't fish here anymore. You have to travel 50 miles out to sea, um, and that can be quite dangerous. So it's, it's a process that needs to be done very carefully, um, but I am definitely in favor of more highly protected marine areas. So this is something I work on myself, and I've seen the benefits firsthand. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's an amazing how marine ecosystems can recover if they're given the chance. And so kind of, I guess, what would like a well protected marine area look like? Yeah, so, um, for example, the ones I work up in Scotland, we've seen like the numbers of um, scallops, for example, increase by four times. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the numbers of lobsters and all the stuff growing on the seabed. And what's really good about that is that all those species that are in marine protected areas, they breed at really high levels. And then most marine animals um, have what we call dispersive larvae. So basically they release their eggs up into the water and they get fertilized. And then they just, as, the, as they hatch, they drift out all over the ocean basically so it's like you've got a little factory of you know baby scallops or baby lobsters or baby fish and it's pumping out all these young individuals so even you get you end up with um benefits all around the protected areas not just in them and this is why you know i think they're really good and so they can have all even when they're quite small they can have a really positive impact yeah that's really interesting. And yeah, I mean, definitely something I didn't know about before. Yeah, there and, you go. Yeah. And so I guess like then kind of looking back at the documentary as a whole, we've kind of like discussed some of the like scientific maybe inaccuracies that there were. And could you just give an overview for people listening, like apart from those that we've already discussed, what other mm. scientific inaccuracies they, there may be? Yeah, I mean, there were some inaccuracies, there were some sort of exaggerations. You know, I covered the one about just them saying there's no such thing as sustainable fisheries. They also said um, by the year 2048, the oceans would be virtually empty. And that study is really quite out outdated. And even the person who wrote it has sort of said, no, that doesn't apply anymore. Um, there were other things like early on, they talked about how whales are fertilizing the ocean and this is providing, you know, the oxygen that we breathe. Like that might be true, but it's a tiny, tiny amount, like a fraction of a percent. And so that, that was another one where they really exaggerated and they just didn't need to. You know, they, like everyone loves whales and dolphins, right? They could have just said, for example, one of the great things with many whale and dolphin species is because we've protected them in most places for the last sort of 30 years, 
their populations are really coming back. Yeah. Like when I was young in Australia, you would never see a whale. Like it was incredible. Now you can get, you can like, even from the shore, you can go down the coast and see whales <laughs> swimming outside the surf and things like this. So, you know, I would have liked to see a bit more positivity, um, but I just don't think that was what the filmmakers had in mind. You know, they wanted yeah. to shock us. So yeah, maybe it's just a different take. Yeah, it was definitely shocking. And I think there was, yeah, yeah. yeah also like, I felt like a set, like a kind of sense of urgency within like the documentary as a whole about making, the, like need to make a change now. Mm. And so I guess what changes do you think need to be made on like an individual and institutional level as a whole? And also like how urgent is that change, I guess? I mean, it is urgent. It's just like with climate change, you know, you could say, oh, well, let's wait 10 years, let's wait 20 yeah. years. But by then the damage is done. And, you know, sometimes we've seen this in the ocean. Some species, when, they, when their populations collapse, they actually never come back. Um, they might not be extinct, but they never, the numbers get so low, they can't breed at enough levels to really recover. So we don't want that to happen. Yeah. We've talked about some of the solutions in terms of individual actions, you know, about like if you can reduce your seafood uh, intake, that's that's fine. But also if you can just think more about it, use these eco labels, find out where it came from, all that sort of thing. The Marine Conservation Society here in the UK, they have a thing called the Good Fish Guide, which is a really good place to start. They have apps. It's, there's a website, etc. Um, in terms of what governments and others can do, you know, my hope is that the attention that this film has generated will make governments, you know, basically bring in the things they need to do more quickly. Yeah. Because yeah. they do tend to be slow to react. Um, one of the things we saw, you know, around the UK and Europe for many years was the scientists would say, right, you need to set the the catch at this level and they'd always go oh well just set it a bit higher you know and again i i see that like spending more money than you're earning you know yeah. it doesn't work yeah. you eat you, you much money and so you know we do need governments to be more serious we need more of these highly protected marine areas um and we also need to i think monitor fishing activity better now because some of the big vessels, they have things like satellite monitoring on them, but there's many that don't. You know, one of my friends said, like, we can we can order a pizza and, and look online and know where, where it is, where the delivery is, but we don't know where our fishing boats are. And that's kind of a bit crazy because the fi fish in the ocean and the marine, you know, yeah. ecosystems yeah. in general, that's, that's a public resource, right? That belongs to you and me. It doesn't belong to the fishermen. So we all should have a say in how it's managed um, because we, you know, we want it to be there for future generations. I, you know, I've been lucky enough to see amazing things in my life. I've got, you know, a couple of kids. I want them to see all the things I've seen, if not better. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, let's all do what we can. Yeah. And so I guess the documentary to finish off has brought like the attention to a lot of people's minds. And yeah. so what like resources would you recommend for people who kind of want to find out more and maybe like find out more about the science behind so yeah that so i mean like in terms of choosing seafood i mentioned the good fish guide by the marine conservation society actually they have a lot of good resources on their website about right. about all different marine issues pollution mm -hmm. fishing climate change etc um, I think, you know, for one place that I could recommend, that's a really good place to start. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of science out there. I'm not going to probably send your viewers down that route. There's not really one single source. And this is the thing. It's like, it's a really complicated issue. So I would start with MCS, Marine Conservation Society. I should say I used to work for them a few years ago, but they're a great team and, you know, they're doing good things for, for the marine environment. So, yeah, check them out for sure. Great. 
I'll definitely be having a look afterwards. And that's it for today. So thank you so much for um, answering that question. Pleasure.